both about what the context and uh, perspective was back then and uh, a few comments, uh, nothing super deep, but uh, a few comments from Ray's perspective looking back and perhaps with application to the future. Next slide, please. So here's the, uh, the timeline for the ARPANET. Uh, the first IMP was installed in September 1969. There was, uh, as you would expect, a period where there was a lot of thought, a uh, civic plan uh, that, that led to the, uh, the, the first game. The imps, imps are what we called uh, routers, or that, that is, we didn't have the term in that day, uh, in those days, and so, uh, but that was what uh, an imp was. It was the, the first router. First one was installed at UCLA. Um, and in the several months prior to that was the design lock process. There was a uh, lengthy period, well, it seemed lengthy at the time, it looks short for in, in retrospect, of expansion, use, and maturation of the ARPANET itself, and then research on other technologies, particularly packet radio and packet satellites, and how to interconnect multiple independent networks, which is what the, in the Internet's all about. In 1983, um, marked a major transition point, the, the transition to TCP IP, the splitting of the ARPANET into two parts. One was the continuation of the sort of academic and research-oriented part, and the other was for the use by the military for their purposes. And uh, that also marked the beginning of the Internet, uh, per se. And then finally, uh, several years later, uh, the last pieces of the original internet were, uh, I'm sorry, the original ARPANET were turned off. Next slide, please. Uh, a few words just to place you know, where I was in the picture. I had been an, an undergraduate at UCLA. I spent a lot of time programming. That's a polite way of saying I didn't spend much time on classes. I spent a lot more time uh, hanging around computers and uh, uh, both for uh, to education and for profit uh, put myself through school. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I went off to MIT briefly for graduate school, came back to UCLA. The ARPANET project was starting. My research interests were off in a different direction, but this seemed like a useful uh, project. I wasn't sure that it had the intellectual depth of what I had been uh, uh, in my youthful arrogance thinking what was it stuff that really mattered. But I thought, well, I'm, I'm pretty good at this stuff. I can lend a hand. I got deeply involved, led the network working group, created the Request for Comment series. Um, I had, over the years since then, done a lot of research in formal methods, network security, and so forth. Uh, and then eventually was the first area director for security in the ITF. And then um, about 20 years ago, we got involved with ICANN. Uh, sharing their Security Disability Advisory Committee, getting on the board of directors, and eventually becoming chairman of the board for the, of the last six and a half years of my tenure, ending about three years ago, uh, ending closer to four years ago now. Next slide, please. All right, so let's go back and look at the ARPANET in more detail. Next slide. Um, I'm going to make some uh, minor comments along the way, and here's a very, very big, broad thought that uh, if you look at uh, sort of what the uh, uh, pivotal points are and when decisions get made and how things play out, uh, I think it's helpful to, um, to think in terms of three things. One is the technology has been improving and we've been all riding that wave and I'll show you a few details of that. That's been huge. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have continued to be the same human beings that we were, uh, for good or bad, and uh, our human nature doesn't change much. And then there should be a smiley face next to that. Every once in a while, good luck helps, and uh, one just benefits from that. Next slide. All right. Uh, from the mid-60s to the early 70s. Next slide. Um, let me take you back to what computing looked like in the mid and and late 1960s, even the early 1960s. Uh, most computers were uh, expensive and uh, uh, not widely distributed. You found them in important places, universities, governments, big businesses, and so forth. And they were uh, mainly used in, what, in a batch processing mode of keeping them busy doing important work. That is, not wasting time 
interactively uh, uh, supporting the humans, but uh, uh, as I say, doing important things. And they were typically, well, many of them were big machines that took up a whole room with a false floor and air conditioning and um, uh, so-called mainframes. But there were places, uh, uh, notably around MIT, but also in other places that were focused on, well, what happens if you change the perspective and think of computers as supporting interactive work so that it facilitates the, what humans uh, want to do? Uh, that led to both small machines as, a, as personal machines, uh, eventually, the laboratory machine, but also big machines used in a time-sharing sense where you had many, many people, uh, uh, many, many in those days, it was like 30 to 50, not thousands, um, sharing one mainframe uh, that would slice up its time and give a little bit of time to each one uh, and give the uh, impression that you were using the machine yourself. Uh, there was also a focus on uh, graphics, on uh, man-machine interaction, on artificial intelligence research, and uh, a lot of this came from a, one particular funding agency in the government, in the U.S. government, uh, which was uh, ARPA, later renamed ARPA. Next slide. So let me tell you just a moment about, uh, about ARPA or DARPA, a uh, well-known story but worth mentioning. Um, Inside the U.S. government, and in particular inside the U.S. Defense Department, there had been uh, multiple efforts to build a space program. You had the Army had a program, and the Navy had a program, and they were competing and not getting uh, very far. And then the Russians put up the first satellite, and that sent a shockwave through the U.S. government. In relatively short order, uh, measured in uh, a couple of months, the U.S. Department of Defense uh, created a new agency that was outside of the Army, Navy, or Air Force, but inside the Department of Defense, plugged in at the very top to uh, uh, prevent technological surprise and focused heavily at initially on the space program and then on to other things. Next slide. And, and that was, and, and when that was called, when that agency was created, it was created as a, as a sort of lightweight uh, agency within the Office of Secretary of Defense. The term Office of Secretary of Defense might bring to, to mind a picture of, you know, one person, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, one support person, uh, the Secretary or Administrator. Actually, the Office of Secretary of Defense is a couple thousand people. Um, and the agency that was created was about 150 people. Uh, small potatoes in terms of large bureaucracy, but nonetheless, a, 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 a not a, a tiny little operation. In 1972, it was moved out of the Office of Secretary of Defense to become a separate defense agency and renamed DARPA, so it acquired the, the initial D. Didn't mean any change at all uh, of significance. And uh, then uh, uh, 20 years later, under Bill Clinton, uh, taking advantage of the fact that a lot of what ARPA had actually accomplished uh, was not only useful for the military, but useful for civilian use as well. They wanted to emphasize the dual use and uh, change the name back to ARPA. That lasted only a few years, and it was renamed back to DARPA. So you'll hear me say ARPA because that's the period that I was involved in, and I spent a, a, a few years in that uh, agency. Um, and that's where the term ARPANET comes from. But uh, you know, since 1972, and with the exception of those few years, uh, it's, it's been DARPA, and so that's the way most people would refer to the agency. Next slide. Within the agency, there were uh, a handful of separate offices, each focused on different technologies. Uh, the Information Processing Techniques Office wasn't one of the original parts of ARPA, but after ARPA had been started for a few years, uh, this, this office was created to focus on long-term research related to computer science. And the strategy was to invest heavily in uh, a handful of centers of excellence, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, Stanford University, Berkeley, and some others, including even um, non-university places, uh, and to really push the envelope with respect to supporting man-machine interaction in a variety of different ways. Uh, time sharing, as I mentioned, AI, artificial, uh, advanced graphics, um, new architectures, and, and then not incidentally, uh, various attempts at trying to connect computers together. Next slide. So before the ARPANET was project was started, what was the state of networking? Well, there had been uh, some successes in connecting computers together in special purpose networks. 
both in the military and in business. So American Airlines had a reservation system called Sabre. Um, there, there were uh, uh, some special purpose military networks that were connected. These were typically controlled in their architecture in that they had the same kind of computers used everywhere and they were used in a very narrow and specific sense. Um, the ARPANET project was uh, initiated in an environment where they already had major research programs going in several different places, as I said, and there was quite a bit of uh, variety in the computers that were there and in the kind of research that was being done. And so uh, this form of interconnecting these computers pressed the uh, limits on what was known or tread, if you will, into the, the unknown regions. So how do you connect a bunch of different kinds of computers? And the other uh, most important and salient fact was that the focus was on interactivity. Uh, it's quite a different matter if you want to connect a bunch of computers together with the purpose of moving mass amounts of data um, efficiently uh, and keeping the circuits busy. It's, uh, if you are, want to support interactive computing, then you've got a, a different kind of problem technically because um, the way people interact, they don't tend to keep the lines full. And I'll show you a bit more about that in a second. Next slide. So uh, then the ARPANET project starts. Next slide. And the initial uh, footprint of the ARPANET consisted of four sites, uh, UCLA in Los Angeles, um, University of California, Santa Barbara, about um, uh, 100 odd miles north uh, along the coast of California. Uh, SRI used to be called Stanford Research International and uh, uh, along the way it got renamed uh, in Menlo Park, California, um, uh, a little bit south of San Francisco, and then the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and the, the uh, initial network, uh, you know, pictured here, the famous diagram that's been used many, many times. Uh, the round circles are the routers. Uh, as I said, we call those imps. And the uh, rectangular boxes are the computers that we used. Uh, and each of them was used in time-sharing mode. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and and uh, interactively. And the, the critical part of the design of the ARPANET was that it would use packets switching as opposed to circuit switching. That we open up into small chunks, and those chunks were sent into the, uh, uh, into the routers, into the ends, uh, which uh, then forwarded them and shared the lines as, as need be. But and the, the goal was to uh, use, use these lines much more efficiently without losing uh, uh, a significant amount of the interactivity as if you had the circuit to yourself. Uh, next slide. So I want to just emphasize again that the focus here was on how to support research in these places, how to connect people together, uh, how to um, uh, press the envelope of what was known about how to do this, create the technology, um, and and take a very long view about uh, the transitions that were being made in both computing and communications. There's been a lot of discussion about well, it used packet switching, and it, it uh, was uh, we would find ways to route around breakages, so it must have been for nuclear survivability. The story is actually a bit more complicated, but the, the the main answer is not that was not the primary goal, or even even a, a direct goal of the ARPANET project itself. Uh, there were some words that if this technology matured, it might be useful in the future for future systems that could be based on that which is all fine and incorrect, but the, the project itself uh, didn't spend any time worrying about that sort of uh, recovery from outages. It did spend time on what do you do if an imp breaks or what do you do if a line breaks. Um, and but that's a, a different, qualitatively different problem than trying to address uh, nuclear survivability, which is a huge, messy, terrible problem that, as best I can tell, the strongest answer is we just hope we never get there. Next slide. This is a picture of what the imp looked like. That's um, about as tall as a person. It's like a small refrigerator. Um, the original imps, uh, which this was one, 
were put in uh, heavy duty metal uh, cases because they were being put in a very hostile environment, that is universities. And uh, the people who designed this were worried about what the students might do. Uh, after some number of these were built at the cost of $100,000 in 1969 dollars, um, they uh, backed off and built ones at about half the price that worked just as well. Each one of these was capable of being connected to three or four uh, computers uh, locally. Locally was started out to be 50 feet and then there were extensions to that. But this was before the creation of local area network technology like Ethernet. And so um, uh, you had small clusters of machines, but not the huge numbers. And indeed, in those days, we didn't have personal computers. We didn't have workstations. They were a little bit in the future. Next slide. So uh, a bit more about packet switching versus circuit switching. <laughs> on the left, uh, well, on the right, let me start there. Uh, uh, when you make a phone call, it typically takes several seconds to initiate the call. And if you're using it for interactive data communication, the amount of data that you're actually putting on the line compared to the amount of time that, that, that is there is a very, very small fraction of the total, typically on the order of 1% or less. Now, on the other hand, you get the benefit of no jitter and the delay is quite fixed. The speed of light in free space is about five microseconds per mile. In wires, it's about half that speed. Um, and on the other hand, in packet switching, um, the setup time goes away because you can just send right away and it goes. And you can drive the efficiency of the use of the lines up into the 50 to 70 percent range before you start getting queuing delays and you can go a little bit further if you, if you really push it. Uh, you do get some variable jitter in terms of when things arrive compared to uh, when they were sent. And you incur some, uh, some uh, delays as you go through each hop. Uh, plus, you get the speed light uh, transmission as well. So there's your trade-off. And if you can live with those, um, which you can for a surprisingly wide range of applications, then packet switching is a huge, huge uh, financial advantage in terms of the use of relatively expensive no, very expensive uh, uh, communication lines. Next slide. So here's the timeline that is a little bit more fine-grained than what I uh, talked about at the outset. Um, there was a, um, a design period, roughly 66 to 68, uh, and then finally a request for quotations was sent out from the government uh, to build the IMS and have them installed. And, uh, Main, most of the focus up to that point had been on the um, topology of the network and on the cost of the communication lines and uh, the efficiency and so forth. Not a whole lot of attention on what the hosts were actually going to say to each other and how they were going to do that. And then in August of 1968, with the request for quotes already uh, released by the government, uh, there was a meeting that um, turned out to be important for, for a certain number of us. Uh, to get together and think about what we we're going to say to each other over this network. As it happened, both Vince Cerf and I were grad students at UCLA. The meeting was held at, uh, at Santa Barbara, uh, chaired by uh, Elmer Shapiro from SRI. And so uh, uh, several of us, uh, on the order of a dozen people, gathered in a room to chat for a, a day and a half about um, how this was going to go. It was pretty much of an open uh, uncharted territory, and we made only one big decision that day, which was that we needed to keep talking to each other, and that to do that, we should start visiting each other's laboratories and uh, get a sense of what the environments were. And there was a certain note of irony that we knew that this network was supposed to support co cooperation at a distance without the need for travel, and the first thing we did was increase our travel budgets enormously. But compared to today's or pre-pandemic anyway, travel, uh, that was tiny, small potatoes measured in hundreds of dollars instead of in tens of thousands of dollars. Um, both Brannock and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, won the bid for building the imps, and they started uh, formally on uh, January 69. Um, meanwhile, our little group uh, continued to meet, and after several months, decided we'd better write down some of the thoughts that we'd been uh, kicking around. And so in April 1969, we 
kicked off an informal set of notes uh, with some trepidation that they might be misinterpreted as asserting authority or uh, uh, putting ourselves in a position that we didn't uh, belong in because if there was no formal charter, there was no formal governance structure or, or anything. And uh, uh, I, I had the pen at that point and I said, well, let's use the term that Bill DeVolne had suggested as request for comments as a way of saying these are informal and they're intended to stimulate discussion, not cut them off. I expected it to be a short-lived uh, series of notes, six months, maybe a year, and then there'd be formal notes. I also expected people who actually knew what they were doing to come along and, and uh, take control. Neither of those things happened, and the RFCs continue um, to this day, although with, with some important transformations, because in those days, we had no way of communicating them except by sending them out by U.S. mail uh, to each other. Nowadays, of course, we have uh, email and we have internet drafts, and so the, uh, the RFCs are transformed. In any case, in very short order, Mo Brannick and Newman did a stellar job, delivered the first game to UCLA in uh, beginning of September 69, the second one to SRI uh, beginning of October 69, and a monthly after that, uh, pretty much. Next slide. Here's what the network looked like in um, uh, June of 1970. So it's uh, uh, nine months, basically, eight, nine months after the first delivery. Less than that, I guess, seven, eight months after the delivery of the first game. Uh, note that there's a uh, concentration in the Southern California area, but there's also now two cross-country lines and a collection of sites in the Boston uh, area, MIT, Old Brannock and Newman and Harvard, uh, with Utah sitting there in the western part of the U.S. Next slide. Seven years later, we stopped drawing the network uh, using the geographic map because uh, there's just too many things to fit on, and this gives a sense of what that growth looks like. Let me also emphasize, back on my slide as well, um, that the, um, uh, the lines that we were using in those days were um, somewhat peculiar by today's technology. They were fundamentally analog lines, uh, 12 voice grade lines that were bonded together to create a 50,000 bit per second, not 56 the like way you would use today, but 50,000 bit per second uh, communication. And the modem that did all of this was a, a relatively humongous piece of equipment that uh, was, uh, each one of the modems was sort of the size of a bread box and they fit into a cabinet sitting next to the imp at about half the size of, of, that, of that imp. Um, today, a so-called voice grade line can carry 56,000 bits uh, digitally, and, uh, and of course we have much, much faster lines. We move from kilobits to uh, megabits to, to gigabits over a long period of time. But in those days, this was considered super fast. It wasn't fast for the kinds of applications that we would do today, Sending video, uh, having um, uh, interactive session as we are having right this minute was in the future. It was stuff that we understood and stuff that we hungered for. There were some preliminary experiments, but it was a long time before we could do what we're doing at this very minute. Next slide and the one after. So, uh, the game plan, if you will, for building ARP in it was, as I said, to connect the existing research sites. And this had some very uh, strong benefits and also colored the work quite a bit. Um, there was a lot of cheap labor available at these sites. Uh, that is, people like uh, like Vint and, and me, who were graduate students, and we were on graduate student stipends. Um, and we were uh, not to... Not to um, Brag at all, but we were uh, decently good at uh, programming and designing things, uh, more or less the equivalent of commercially uh, professional people. And it wasn't just us at UCLA, but it was true across the board. These were um, cutting edge research sites and attracted. Um, another key thing that uh, came out of the project was the all important decision to separate the routing from the host computers. Uh, instead of just connecting the host computers directly to each other, uh, they're connected through these, through these routers. It is 
absolutely what's done today everywhere. Nobody thinks twice about it, but it was a non-trivial decision, particularly because computers were so expensive that the idea of, of having yet, you're going to put another computer at every place, how much is that going to cost? Um, and so, uh, but also prices were dropping at a rate that made it feasible. Uh, further, U.S. government had access to uh, uh, buying these circuits or leasing these circuits at a, at a price that was qualitatively less than if we tried to do it commercially. <coughs> so uh, we used the, uh, uh, the routers that were built and the communication lines, uh, the routers from both Brannock Newman, the, the communication lines from, Bull, from AT&T, and then um, left open how the protocols were going to be defined. There wasn't actually a top-level uh, concern uh, going in, but um, there was a sense of, well, uh, we'll figure it out as we go. Next slide. There had been a kind of kitchen cabinet that Larry Roberts, who was in charge of uh, IPTO, used um, that uh, worked with him in the period of two four sites and the uh, basic outline of the network. Um, next slide. <coughs> Us kids got involved and we started to think about, okay, how are we going to uh, get involved in this? Main thing we brought them to, uh, to the party, if you will, is that we had had, as I said, a lot of experience in um, designing operating systems, programming language, and building systems, and so forth. And so, with that mindset, we view the ARPANET from both the perspective of um, what, could, what could we do, and also how would the users, and when we talked about the users, we were really talking about people like us. What did we want it to look like for the kinds of things that we wanted to do? Next slide. After a bit of thought, um, we settled on using the idea of a virtual circuit as a building block. It wasn't the solution to everything, but it was uh, a, a useful idea as a, a piece of architecture uh, that would hide the details of the packet switching. So even though the packet switching was crucial in terms of making efficient use of the communications um, uh, that was being provided, we then overlaid that with a way of hiding that that's what was going on and said, okay, now imagine that you've got a virtual circuit between any two points. Uh, can you build the things that you want to build on top of that? In particular, the obvious um, applications were remote interaction, um, uh, as if you had dialed up with a terminal. And the other, of course, is moving files. Uh, for one. You want to say, take this file and move it and put it over there. Uh, both of those are workhorses uh, even today, but uh, uh, they were the, the principal folks. But we equally wanted not to be limited to just those two applications. Next slide. Um, so the, the, the uh, actually, I'm sorry, back up one slide. So the last, the last point is one that I, I should emphasize. Uh, we wanted the framework uh, to be to open and permit more general forms of intercommuter interaction. Uh, uh, that was uppermost in our mind, even though we knew that the uh, file transfer and uh, what became the internet protocol would be dominant to start with. And one of the things that we thought about was, well, these, these 50 kilobit lines are fast, but they're not as fast as we'd like them to be. Uh, there's a lot of interaction that takes place that we want to be very, very quick and lively. And so we came up with the idea of possibly at the beginning of a session, we might download a small program that could be interpreted locally. Uh, that would take care of uh, uh, easy interaction. So uh, if you were typing a command, for example, and you wanted to erase a character, uh, maybe that could happen locally, uh, and you wouldn't have to forward those characters uh, back and forth across the entire network. Um, that was a very powerful idea. Um, it didn't get fully implemented until uh, about 25 years later with the appearance of ActiveX and then Java and now uh, RESTful interfaces, but it was one of the things that uh, was, um, that we, as I say, we thought about and actually did some uh, paper designs, a little bit of implementation at, at the uh, outset. Uh, now the next slide, please. So focusing on uh, what, what we call very blandly the host-host protocol, uh, 
um, that created a virtual circuit. Uh, at first, it seemed pretty easy, and then a couple of uh, uh, important factors uh, became visible to us. One was, well, uh, you don't want to just allow the sending side to send arbitrarily. You want the receiving side to be able to have some control of whether it's going to be overrun. And so we created the notion of flow control. As it turns out, flow control is harder than it looks, uh, and it's multi-layered. The imps themselves also engaged in flow control, but their flow control wasn't, wasn't took care of their needs to not have their buffers be overrun. But we also realized that hosts needed to have a similar sort of thing. So you got multi-layers of flow control there. <laughs> we didn't know how to do it very well. We didn't know what the parameters ought to be. We didn't even know whether we wanted to measure the bits or the number of messages, uh, the packets being sent. Uh, and we settled somewhat awkwardly on measuring both and providing the receiving side with controls on both how much space was available and how many messages it was willing to handle. Um, the next thing we discovered was that, um, you know, for interactive sessions, sometimes you are uh, dealing with a program that's run away, you need to hit an interrupt character. The interrupt character depends upon the operating system you're working with. It might be control C in one uh, for one operating system or control Z for another or the Dell character for a different one. But so we needed an abstraction of that. But the important thing is we needed for that signal to get communicated across the network, even if all of the um, uh, packets were stored and stacked up and there was no room to send another packet. <coughs> so we had to, to um, uh, expand or, or uh, embellish the base Kotos protocol with this extra capability to communicate uh, interrupts. A different issue is that uh, a lot of these operating systems were provided by the vendors, uh, IBM or Digital Equipment Corporation or uh, uh, whatever company was providing it, and it was not typical from their point of view to allow the users, customers, to get into the operating systems to make changes, and yet that was necessary in order to provide access, uh, to, in order to connect up the, uh, the imps. We needed a, a novel, a, 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 a de novo um, hardware interface, and we needed code inside of the operating system. Um, that caused me to create the terminology network control program that uh, designated that software. Um, over time, the term host host protocol was too bland. NCP was a, uh, a very handy acronym. And it got repurposed into network control protocol to designate what had previously been known as the host host protocol. And the idea that you had to make an incision into the operating system uh, was uh, widely, widely accepted. No, no, uh, no mystery about that. And there was no need to emphasize uh, that with a special term. Next slide. So the uh, uh, to, to to summarize in a way, uh, the ARPANET. Uh, connected uh, a heterogeneous set of computers. Uh, they weren't all the same, they didn't come from the same uh, vendors, uh, and there were quite a lot of differences. Uh, they were different in uh, uh, not only the hardware, but also even in the way they represented characters. You had different representations for uh, character sets. Uh, ASCII didn't become common until just a bit later. IBM used uh, extended binary control, uh, binary binary encoded um, interchange uh, uh, called EPSIDIC, uh, and there were others. Um, so over time, uh, over the next several years, um, uh, byte size became standardized, character sets became more standardized, uh, and, and we had originally used uh, one-way connections with the intent of using a pair of them to set up connection, and it was Decided that was unnecessary, and so every every virtual circuit that we created was a two-directional circuit. And so the network control protocol got replaced by um, the transmission control protocol that uh, Ben Surf uh, and his team worked on, um, and that was part of the transition to the internet with the insertion of a of a layer below TCP called Internet Protocol that uh, connected disparate networks together. So that was the critical thing. But the ARPANET was a homogeneous network from a communications point of view. It had a single 
uh, vendor it had a single operator in Bulgaric and they had operations uh, uh, control room uh, kept track of which ends were up and down which uh, uh, which lines were up and down and so forth and it was understood pretty quickly that there would be other networks and that you couldn't have just one network for the entire world you're going to have a lot of independent networks and that's what led to the internet and the uh, worldwide impact that we've all experienced. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that had not been planned exactly, but uh, in retrospect, um, is not a big surprise, is that uh, the ARPANET project engendered uh, the creation of uh, a community, actually a, a multiple sub-communities as well. There were uh, a number of people who were expert at the software and the protocol side of things and started to help out the, the next neighbor. So the people who were grad students working in uh, each of the initial sites wound up doing uh, neighborly consulting with other sites as they came on board. Um, the development of hardware interfaces led to a little bit of uh, uh, manufacturing commonality. A couple of companies started to produce interfaces for uh, the fall machine, and and then uh, there was a, a much bigger and more important uh, factor of people who were working in networking started to think of themselves as being part of the same community. We had network working group meetings, is what we called the group. Uh, when we had 50 people show up, we thought, oh my goodness, this is getting pretty big, and we started to subdivide our meetings into two parallel sessions um, over period of time that has all morphed into the Internet Engineering Task Force and now, at least pre-pandemic times, uh, three times a year the meetings have between 1,000 and 2,000 people show up and left lots and lots, I don't have, have any idea how many people participate remotely and, and via uh, working groups online and, and via availing us. Next slide. Well, the top level of what the ARPANET accomplished was to create a clarity across the world, actually, that networks were feasible. Uh, the reactions uh, of the existence of the ARPANET, uh, you could feel it around the world. Uh, the French, the, the British, and the Canadians, for example, all started or had networking projects. Um, I'm particularly fond of the interactions we had with some Canadians wanted to build a network to connect Canadian universities. Uh, I don't think that particular project came to fruition, but they eventually, of course, they did connect not only their universities, but everything. But they called their, uh, their proposed project Canyonet. And uh, if you look at the geography of, of Canada, most of the population is right along the southern border. You have, uh, or near it, you have Montreal and, and uh, Toronto and Vancouver and so forth. And, and it is not butt up against the, the border there in the southern part. And, um, but one of the things they perceived right away from a political stance is that they wanted to connect those sites so that data would travel. Uh, their slogan was they wanted their data to travel east-west, not north-south, meaning they didn't want their connectivity to be in the form of send it into the U.S. and then pick it up later and bring it back out. Um, didn't, didn't bother those of us who were working on, on the ARPANET, but it was just interesting to see the, uh, the political side of this uh, emerging absolutely from the beginning uh, in the thought process. And there were similar issues in other parts of the world. Another key result, of course, in the ARPANET is that uh, a heterogeneous network, not specific to particular vendors, was not only possible but had benefits and that's in contrast to what some of the companies, IBM and Digital Equipment and, and some other companies, tried to do, which was to build um, proprietary networks that will connect their products together and be more tightly integrated into their operating systems. Those succeeded for a period of time, but were eventually overtaken <coughs> by the enormous power of having an open network. Um, the, uh, the, uh, another very big thing was the idea that protocols could be layered um, into uh, and that you could build on top of the layers 
our, our focus was that these layers um, didn't have any specific structure to them and that they were there more for convenience than as an than a, for imposition. You could um, uh, get underneath them if you had to, you could ignore them, you could put layers in between. I started, I was very heavily involved in the early periods. I went off for several years to do uh, other kind of research I was interested in. When I came back uh, and started paying attention to network, and I discovered that the OSI folks had decided that there were exactly seven layers. I almost fell over laughing. Uh, and kind of missed the whole point. And if you look at the so-called application layer, you look inside of that, there are a zillion uh, different layers embedded there. So, uh, you know, I don't want to be too negative about, about the seven-layer model. It's helpful in some respects, but it is, it is uh, not accurate, uh, nor is it uh, uh, and it's a bit distracting in some respects. Um, Far more important than any of that is that uh, a key thing about the way we worked was that we had an open protocol stack, as I said, and an open standards process. The documentation was available to anybody, and anybody could uh, participate. Next slide. So those three aspects of openness uh, were qualitatively different from the standards process used in the telephone networks, for example, and have made a huge difference uh, in the world. The, the fact that the specs are available free of charge to anybody, anywhere, anytime, and that participation is open to individuals, not just to governments, not just to big companies, uh, is one of the things that's driven a lot of innovation. Next slide, please. Um, one of the key things that emerged as the in the transition to the internet is the so-called hourglass model, in which there is a common protocol in the middle, uh, the IP layer, and then uh, a lot of room both above and below that for variation. Next slide. The stuff above is a multiplicity of uses, and the stuff below are a diversity of transmission mechanisms. And you see there radio and Wi Fi and Ethernet and fiber and coax and etc. And above, you see all kinds of applications. Next slide. And focusing just on the top side of that, next slide. Here we have uh, HTTP for the web. We have email that got created relatively quickly. Uh, SIP for voice and other interactive uh, <coughs> analog type applications. Um, DNS as a name lookup translation, etc. And uh, whole industries and, and major companies created uh, around all of these. Next slide, please. Uh, the open participation also meant that uh, there wasn't a, uh, any uh, limitation as to where the contributors would come from. Um, sometimes I would joke, you know, that in the original ARPANET plan, if you read it very carefully, it says, oh, yes, and at this point we decide that we're going to use, we're going to have the creation of voice over uh, packet switching, and let's have the Estonians do that. Uh, in those days, it probably would have been hard to get very many people to even figure out where Estonia was. Um, and along comes Skype, and all of a sudden, long distance phone calls, which used to be expensive even in the US and enormously expensive internationally, became essentially free. Uh, tremendous disruption and uh, uh, tremendous improvement in many of our lives. Next slide. So I, I put at the beginning the, uh, these major forces. Um, let me say just a few words about that. Next slide. <coughs> On the technology side, there are two things that were happening over a long period of time. One is um, Moore's Law, which is really a, uh, an observation of how fast the technology was changing rather than a, a, a force that being applied to it, um, translates into a factor of 10 improvement in cost performance uh, every five years. Uh, nothing in human nature has ever changed at that rate. Uh, uh, if you look at labor productivity figures, uh, it's a good year if productivity improves, say, 3%. Here we're getting um, uh, improvements measured, um, you know, qualitatively differently from that. 10 years, 10, a factor of 10 every five years is a factor of 100 every 10 years, and over a 40-year period is 100 million. That is an annual rate of return, if you will, of 60% per year. Try getting that on your money. And then 
that helps from a brute force point of view, and uh, uh, it's certainly one of the key factors that's uh, had an effect on a networking. But the other is that we've also spent a lot of time on computer science aspects, um, improvement in algorithms, improvement in graphics, improvement in artificial intelligence, speech understanding, etc. Next slide. Here's Moore's law plotted. Uh, the, the axis, the y-axis on the left, those are powers of 10, and, um, and then the years are plotted uh, down uh, on the bottom, and then the fine print, and you can't read this very well, but it'll be in the slide deck, are uh, uh, plotting different aspects of the technology, the cost of floppy drives, the cost of big drives, the cost of uh, memory modules, um, the cost of uh, core memories and flip-flops and so forth. And all of the curves go basically in the same direction. That's roughly linear down into the right, which is factors of 10 every few years. Uh, just, uh, I thought this is helpful. This is real data. Um, and in the slide, uh, in the notes, I think, uh, is a reference to and credit to the, uh, to the man who put this together, a professor uh, in, uh, I think Australia. Next slide. Um, this is um, just me uh, uh, using the opportunity to make a suggestion. I think it's helpful to have a little bit of technical literacy. The easiest uh, and most enjoyable and shortest uh, suggestion I have is an essay by a, a early 1900s naturalist called J.B.S. Haldane titled On Being the Right Size. I haven't been able to pin down the exact publication date, but in the early 1920s somewhere. Um, in which he observes that in the animal kingdom, um, most of the textbooks of his day don't talk about the differences in the sizes of animals, uh, but in fact, size and complexity are very, very uh, closely related to each other. You can't scale a dynamic system up or down without changing it uh, dramatically. And in the case of animals, uh, you're just relating how much oxygen they have to take in uh, to their, uh, it's related to their body mass, but their ability to do it is related to their surface area. So you get a cube versus uh, square uh, tension, and uh, a number of other things happen. And this happens in all dynamic systems, whether or not we're talking about uh, biological systems or we're talking about uh, man-made systems or computer systems. Uh, so if you have time, uh, I recommend it. It's only a few pages long, and it's, it's nice reading. Next slide. Well, <laughs> technology is good. Human nature, as I said, uh, is, is stays more or less constant. And uh, you can make up your version of the good and the bad, if you like. Um, on the good side, a lot of initiative, a lot of innovation, uh, cooperation. And on the other side, all of the factors that bedevil us in an ordinary society uh, come into play in the networking world. Next slide. Um, economics and, and uh, market forces also come into uh, <coughs> come into play. Ideal, the ideal is that you've got uh, an open market with everybody uh, able to compete on a level ground. It turns out that in actual uh, real life, um, particularly on the supply side, nobody likes that. They all try one way or another to gain an unfair advantage, um, and that's important for stimulating uh, innovation in various ways. Next slide. That's the end of the formal uh, slides. I've uh, taken a few minutes longer than I had hoped to, so I will just uh, pause here and uh, be available for any questions or comments, um, and delighted to uh, engage in the action. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. It's uh, Glenn again. Uh, okay, so I've been inviting people to type in the chat. Uh, let me start off with uh, Alfredo's question. Um, Alfredo, did you want to gain access to audio and, and uh, elaborate on your question? Uh, sure, thank you. Okay, go thank ahead. Uh, this is Alfredo. And thank you, uh, Steve, for, for the, uh, the presentation. It was great. Uh, I, I was wondering, Back in the 90s, late 90s, uh, I was part of a research project with uh, National Science Foundation, and we were talking about Internet 2. 
uh, and, and which is still, uh, as I understand, up, up, up and running. So I was wondering, what interaction did you on your team with ARPANET had in in innovating and moving forward the uh, Internet 2 project? Well, we're talking about our team. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. There's a big difference in time. Um, the, the initiation of the ARPANET in the early days of building protocols was in the early 1970s and continuing on. Internet 2 was a good deal later. Um, uh, as I said, it was it was DARPA that was initiating this network research. In the earliest days, the National Science Foundation's attitude about computers were that these were big machines that uh, supported uh, real science, physicists in particular. And it was several years before they started to engage in supporting computer science research generally and networking as well. When they did get involved, they, they got involved in a very, very big and important way with the creation of first CSNet and then NSFNet and then finally, uh, uh, well, NSF, NSFNet became a network of networks with a big NSFNet backbone and a lot of regional networks. Um, and the speeds of the network that they built were based primarily on um, uh, megabit uh, speeds as opposed to kilobit speeds. Internet 2 was a big leap past that, but by that time, uh, commercial networks also uh, came alive. And so Internet 2, as you said, was started in the, in the 90s, but has coexisted with a, uh, a, a much, much bigger commercial uh, footprint. Uh, I have not been keeping track closely of Internet 2, although it's uh, engaged uh, in some interactions from time to time, and they're still pushing forward on uh, certain fronts, particularly to support very high-speed networking uh, for advanced applications in, in universities. Um, but um, uh, it, it's, it's much more specialized than the broad internet, so I don't have a whole lot more to add to it than that. Great, thank you, uh, Steve. Let me let me uh, read out uh, Murud uh, Khalif's uh, question. He's asking. Uh, what roles uh, did the French network, the Cyclades, and the British also uh, NSFNet in the development of the internet? Um, let me take the British first. Um, uh, Donald Davies and uh, his team at the National Physical Laboratory uh, had pretty much the right ideas and uh, were trying to build something equivalent uh, but they didn't have the level of funding that was available in the U.S. Um, I believe that the, they are properly credited with introducing the term packet switching. I think Roger Scandalberry uh, interacted with uh, Larry Roberts and others at the Gatlinburg meeting in um, 1967, uh, as I understand. I wasn't there, but uh, that's the story I hear. Um, the French work was very interesting. Um, along a separate path. Um, Louis Poussin uh, uh, was at the helm of creating uh, c -plots. Um And um, I, there's a certain amount of controversy as to what ideas were embedded there and versus what ideas were embedded in the, in the ARPANET and then the internet. Um, the, I'm not actually, I haven't spent a lot of time sorting out. Um, but uh, they built a very credible network. I think the fundamental issue there was that it was sort of focused on being French and limited and, and sort of got overtaken by events in Europe uh, as the, uh, the internet protocols uh, basically won out over the, in the uh, protocol wars later between the TCP IP suite and the OSI suite. Um, and so it was, I would say, an important part of history. Um, but I don't know precisely how many, which ideas flowed that uh, one could trace directly back to Cyclops. Great. Uh, thank you for, for the answer, Steve. Uh, due to time, I know you have a, another call within 30 seconds. So I'll have to wrap this up. Uh, thank you again. This was a huge contribution 
to our body of knowledge and all of these uh, will be recorded and thank you Eduardo for live streaming to the at large community today for this session as well okay on behalf of everyone thank you again for your participation I, I hope you can uh, uh, visit and, and see some of the other sessions that we're going to be doing throughout this this module and again we appreciate your time and energy today thank you very much and uh, appreciate the opportunity great thanks again Steve bye bye Okay, that wraps it up, folks. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And uh, Steve's rushing off to another meeting. Uh, and again, thank you for uh, completing uh, the surveys. We have 17 uh, responded surveys. I'm not sure if people have been watching this session on Facebook as well, but it was an experiment today. And thank you again for, for attending and uh, thanks for the questions. And also a special shout out to Lila for uh, finding that resource so quickly and and I converted it to an ebook for you to share. So uh, that is that's is great. And thanks Joan for for joining us today as well. Uh, Alfredo, are you still there? Not sure if he 